the New Jersey gubernatorial debate. Sponsored by CBS2, CBS3, WCBS News Radio 880, 1010 Winds, NorthJersey.com, and William Patterson University. Here is your moderator, CBS2's Christine Johnson. And good evening to you. We are coming to you live from the campus of William Patterson University in Wayne, New Jersey, where the candidates for governor will face off in the final debate before the election. Now, this debate is sanctioned by ELECT, the New Jersey Election Law Enforcement Commission. Joining me here at the table, my colleague from Philadelphia, CBS3 anchor Jessica Dean. Alfred Doblin, opinion page editor of NorthJersey.com and The Record, part of the New Jersey USA Today Network, and also Levon Putney, evening anchor at WCBS News Radio 880. We'd also like to welcome our live audience here tonight, and we do ask those in attendance to do remain respectful and not interfere with the debate. This debate, by the way, is streaming on Facebook.com slash CBS New York and on Facebook.com slash CBS Philly. You can watch it in Spanish on WLNY TV 1055 in North Jersey and WPSG in South Jersey. Now, candidates will have one minute to answer each of the questions and also 30 seconds for a rebuttal as warranted. Now. Let's welcome to the candidates on stage here tonight, running for New Jersey Governor, former Ambassador to Germany, Phil Murphy, and Lieutenant Governor, Kim Guadano. Welcome to you both. My first question goes to you, Lieutenant Governor. You served alongside Chris Christie for eight years. What do you say to voters who just cannot consider to vote for you for governor, considering just your affiliation with Christie. Well, thank you for the question and welcome William Patterson. Thank you for having us both tonight. I want to say to start, quite frankly, anybody who knows me knows I'm not Chris Christie. I'm running on my record. I'm running on my values. I'm running on my principles. My record for the last eight years has been to be Chris Christie's lieutenant governor. I haven't been the governor of the state of New Jersey. He was the one who made the final calls. When I had a complaint about Governor Christie, I made it privately. I think that's the way it should happen. Vice presidents and presidents, vice presidents don't get out ahead of governors or presidents, and I don't think lieutenant governors should get out ahead of governors. I do believe, though, that when the governor finally decided that he was going to start to tax the, in, uh, the individuals, uh, increase the gas tax, sorry, when they, he, I had to stand up and disagree. Phil Murphy, on the other hand, stood with the governor and, in, and voted in favor and, and supported the gas tax. You mentioned that you did voice your concern when you did a disagree with the governor on some issues. Can you give us an example of where you may have swayed his decision? Oh, but I wouldn't tell you that. I don't think we should tell you that. I think people need to understand how lieutenant governor's offices work. Quite frankly, if I become the governor, I wouldn't let or expect my lieutenant governor, Carlos Render, to disclose our private conversations. I suspect that Phil wouldn't want that to happen. But I did have to disagree with the governor when he started to tax the middle class in New Jersey. I stood up and said no at the uh, last summer and Phil Murphy stood with Chris Christie and said yes to the 23 cent gas tax. Mr. Murphy, your campaign commercials document that you were raised in a working class family. But that is not how you live today and it's not how you live for the past few years. You made millions at Goldman Sachs. How can you possibly relate to the working class family living in New Jersey? Let me say, first of all, I'm honored to be here with the Lieutenant Governor and each of you and the whole audience here at William Patterson. I see that last question a little bit differently. I would just say, with, res with all due respect, the Lieutenant Governor has been standing beside the Governor uh, 2,829 days, so his record is her record. Um, I grew up in a in a home which was working poor. My dad didn't get out of high school, my mom did. We all worked, we just didn't have money. I worked under the table when I was 13 years old. I slept in my parents' bedroom until I was nine. That experience of growing up, barely hanging in the middle class, day in and day out, is what burns most deeply inside of me. 
So with all of the, of the chapters of my life as an adult, I'm a proud public school product. I worked in business. I served the United States under President Barack Obama as the U.S. ambassador to Germany. I served on the national board of the NAACP. I chaired a women's shelter in Monmouth County where we live. I'm proud of all that, but the experience that burns most deeply is how I grew up. But can you see the concern here? I mean, last year you made over $7 million. You live in a multi-million home here in New Jersey. You do not know what it takes to struggle to put food on the table. I would say with all due respect, I do. Uh, I grew up that way. Uh, again, my dad took any job he could. He did not have a high school education. My mom did. She was largely a secretary and, and, and helped bring us up. She made sure we went to college. He made sure we cared about the community and, and service. Uh, but I know, what, I know all too well what that, that's like, believe me. Our next question from Jessica Dean. Mr. Murphy, you said you're willing to go beyond designating sanctuary cities like Philadelphia, like New York, which protect undocumented immigrants, and make New Jersey a sanctuary state. Now, would you do that knowing that New Jersey is then at risk of losing millions of dollars in federal aid? I think we had, I'm glad you brought this up because we had an incomplete discussion about this last time. Uh, and the fact of the matter is one of the biggest police, uh, un the biggest police union came out and, and made this point better than I could. The reality is when residents in a city or a state feel comfortable uh, about engaging with law enforcement and they're not worried about their immigration status, uh, without question you have a safer environment. You have safer communities and a safer state. And again, the lieutenant governor uh, has a law enforcement background. Uh, sh she knows that. We can't put politics ahead of public safety. The reality is if folks feel free to engage, you have a safer community. Um, I believe, and I'm not a lawyer, but I'm relying on counsel and, and advice I've gotten from others as it relates to this threat uh, that, that, that the federal government and President Trump could use, could use against us. I think that's an empty threat and we would fight that tooth and nail to the full extent of the law. Our dreamers, our immigrant families, we need to make sure they realize they're welcome in the state. But if that money does go away, because they've made that threat, and if you're talking millions of dollars to a state like New Jersey, what would you do to fill that gap, well, that we need, budget? This is a good example. Unfortunately, it's one of many examples these days where we need governors with steel backbones who are gonna stand up to this president and stand up to what's coming at us, whether it's in uh, threats to withhold federal funding, whether it's the environment or public education or criminal justice, social justice. Uh, we're gonna be probably in court for every single day of our time with an attorney general alongside who's got a steel backbone and fighting for every dollar. Ms. Guadana, do you have a response? Yes, of course I do. I was the sheriff of Monmouth County and when I became the sheriff I was shocked to find out that we could release a violent criminal from our jail without running an immigration background check. So I got a computer and I got someone trained on that computer to do a one simple thing, one a criminal background check to see if he was an illegal alien. And I don't believe that the people of New Jersey want to see a violent criminal released from our jails if there's an immigration detainer against them. I think they believe, and I believe, that those detainers are being run and background checks are being run anyway. If we had done just that, then Jose Carranza would not have been in a schoolyard in 2008 shooting four children in the back of the head. If we had done just that, then Edgar Mendoza would not have been climbing up the back uh, stairs of a house and raping a six-year-old just a month ago. All I'm saying is that in order, the, one of the things the governor of the state of New Jersey has to do, and one of the primary things they're required to do is to protect the public. And a sanctuary state will harbor criminals, it will impact and, and challenge law enforcement officers, and as you said already, it will, it will put at risk millions of dollars of funding for those people you wanted to help Thank you, most. Thank you, we're <clears throat> out of time on that question. I'd like to bring in Alfred Doblin for our next question. Uh, Ms. Guidano. <coughs> We're going to talk about something near and dear to everybody in New Jersey's heart, property taxes. You have a circuit breaker plan to provide property tax relief. If the school portion of your local taxes hits a certain point, breaker kicks in, and then the state, depending on the income, could give that homeowner up to $3,000. Well, that's a lot of $3,000. That's a lot of breakers. Where's the money coming from? Well, first, to be more specific, on average, um, the homeowner would earn about $800 
per household. So on average, and we believe it will cost about a billion five. I think we have laid out very specifically a plan for how we pay for 3% uh, of our $34 billion budget. I believe the people of New Jersey need property tax relief. It is the number one problem facing them today, and I have a plan to fix property taxes in New Jersey. Phil Murphy does not. Well, your plan, if I understand it, um, you want to do an audit of, of all government functions, state functions. Right. $1.5 billion is a lot of money. I mean, right. you were part of the current administration. Is there $1.5 billion hidden somewhere in the state house we don't know about? Well, let me tell you, that's a fair question. Let me ask, let me tell you a couple of things. First of all, the last time an audit was done was in 1983 with Governor Kane. They saved $100 million. Two other audits have been done recently in other states. They've saved $2 billion apiece. At least I have a plan, Al. I mean, what I hear from Phil Murphy's team is that he is not going to address property taxes at all. I haven't seen or heard Phil Murphy t addressing anything to help the people in New Jersey who need the most help now, and that has to do with property taxes. Well then, Mr. Murphy, what, what is your plan? Mr. Murphy, what is your plan? Well, sir, I would say with all due respect, um, I think an audit's a good idea too, by the way. 2,829 days. Uh, we could have had an audit, I think, uh, accomplished by now. <laughs> I don't, I don't think a fancy title, a, a gimmick, the circuit buzzer, it sounds like an overstock item at Crazy Eddie's. That's not a plan. You have to, you have to back it up with real money. This administration, property taxes are up 17% during the Christie Guadagno years. They've, if you're a, a very wealthiest among us, a big corporation or a hedge fund, you've had the time of your life because they've had lots of breaks and the middle class is paid through the nose. Funding schools fully is property tax relief. We're committed to undoing the benefits that the corporations and hedge funds and, 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 and wealthiest among us have had and driving that money into fully funding public education and that is direct property tax relief. All right, thank you, Mr. Murphy. One quick question to our audience. Once again, every time you clap or scream, it does take moments away from our candidates and all adds up to the end. So we'd like to get to the issues tonight, okay? One more time, and let's go I ahead and stay bottle? quiet. Um, no, you don't. Right now, we're going to go to the next question, um, and that again is uh, on the issue of property taxes. So well, we, can, we, we can we can talk a little bit about that. As you know, Mr. Murphy, New Jersey homeowners they pay the highest property taxes in the nation, and there is a salary cap that limits raises for police and firefighters to two percent, which then helps keep property taxes down. That cap is due to expire at the end of this year. So will you keep the cap and side with homeowners, or will you side with police and firefighters and let that cap expire? Yeah, I mean, that's a false choice in my humble opinion. I'll make a decision based on the facts. There's a report coming out in December. Half of the committee put their report out, which was a complete political stunt. Okay, but the report is coming out in December. Election day is in November, and our voters would like to know where you stand well, on that issue. I, I would like our voters to know that I want to make decisions based on facts, and, and, and that's that's what I that's what I believe in. And we've only had half of the group come out so far. Um, you, you mentioned two percent which is important. Now, again, th this is an us versus them administration we've had for almost eight years. In this case, pitting fiscal responsibility, and who wouldn't want fiscal responsibility given the train wreck of our economy against perhaps the bravest people in the state, police, fire, first responders. That's an awful choice. Leadership gets those, both of those interests around a table based on the facts and makes a decision with all interests, and that's what I, I would do. I, I, but I would also remind folks, as I mentioned a minute ago to Alfred, that 2% is important, and we have to get this right, and we'll make that decision based on the facts. So one last 53 time. 53% of a property tax bill is public education. That's been underfunded by $9 billion. That's real property one tax One last relief. time before I get to Ms. Guadana's response Please. to that. You will not go on the record tonight to say whether or not you will keep that uh, absolute cap there. the facts I will not I want to see the facts and I want to get all the parties around a table and make the right decision leadership is tough sometimes and that's what this will require all right Ms. Guadano, which side are you on? Right, let's talk about leadership for a second. You have all the facts available to you to make a decision. You just want to dodge the answer, and I'll tell you why he wants to dodge the answer. He's, he 
he has been endorsed by ev virtually every public sector union in the state, and he has promised them privately that he will not endorse an arbitration cap or a 2% cap because they don't want it. He's a man who runs commercials every day about how he's not in the pocket of the special interests. Well, he has made promises in the, to those special interests that has resulted in his refusal to answer your very, very simple question, a question, by the way, that the lieutenant governor that he's chosen has answered not once but twice, and that is that, he, they, that she would have signed the property taxes. She voted on it the first time when she was the assembly leader because she wanted to provide property tax relief, and she voted it on a second time when it ran out. And as to $9 billion, I have one question for you, Phil. Where are you getting the money? Ladies and gentlemen, look around the room. That $9 billion is coming from your back pocket. May I answer that? Yes, ma'am. May I answer that? Or? Yes. I'll I would just say I'll, the $9 billion dollars is coming from your really wealthy friends, the biggest corporations, and the hedge funds who you've, who you've taken care of. That's where it's coming from. Okay, and every dime of it's going back into the middle class, and they deserve it. All right, let's go on to the next now question. I get to this, one that. Coming, this one coming from Levon Putney. Go ahead. Thank you. And this question is for both. Uh, tens of thousands of jobs were lost in the downturn of Atlantic City. It's been under state control, so now what is your vision for success for Atlantic City? We can start with you, Mr. Murphy. It'll, thank you. Atlantic City uh, has gone through hell and back. The good news is it's off the map, but the price that was paid was enormous. Enormous job losses, you mentioned. Atlantic County leads all counties in America in foreclosed homes. It's a, as unique a community as we have in the state. It's a proud community. I was there last night. I'm there all the time. Uh, it's a great community. It needs help. I'm not a fan of these takeovers. Uh, every single time it's over the top, every single time it's in communities of color, whether it's school districts or entire communities. I am a believer that communities like Atlantic City, though, needs a governor who is a partner working on the ground, hand in glove, to continue to develop the momentum that has started its nascent stages. The casinos have stabilized. The employment has stabilized. The, the um, economy in Atlantic City must be diversified. Stockton University is opening up a campus uh, in Atlantic City. That's a really good step in the right direction. So non-gaming investment will matter a lot there, and I want to work with Atlantic City to do that. Ms. Guadano. You know, Phil, I, I find that incredible based on your position when it comes to tax credits. The only thing that keeps Atlantic City alive now and attracts businesses to Atlantic City are those tax credits that have allowed and attracted place, places like the Hard Rock Cafe. Um, that's why Atlantic City is on its way back, plus some very hard decisions had to be made. What I want to know from you, Phil, is while you were in Atlantic City last night, did you visit that food bank that I talked about last week so you could talk to some of the people who are working two jobs every day to put food on their table. Did you visit that food bank to talk to the woman who needed to go to the food bank twice a week in order to put food on her table? Because if you had, you would have heard that they can't afford more property taxes, higher property taxes. I'm going to lower property taxes, you're going to raise them, and you're going to move these people out of New Jersey. You've left the middle class behind, and now you've left the truth behind. I, I don't, I didn't have to, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't in that food bank last night, but that's how I grew up. I know that all too well. Now, I have a follow-up question, but before I do, uh, you said you were no fan of state takeovers. Yes. If elected, would you end I, the state takeover? I would undo that state takeover, but I would say that we would be there on the ground. The governor, the executive branch of the st state would be on the ground working with the local elected officials to keep the, div the, the progress that we've seen in Atlantic City and hopefully a whole lot more. Okay, now would you support gaming at the Meadowlands in North Jersey? Gaming, North Jersey gaming, I've supported strongly, and here's my rationale. Number one, it's a huge job creator, and we're desperate for jobs. Number two, if it's not in North Jersey, before we know it, it's going to be on the west side of Manhattan. The projects that were voted down last year had elements where they would send a significant amount of uh, income to Atlantic City. Uh, and that's a big basis upon which also that I was supportive of it. My fear is if there's a, a casino on the west side of Manhattan, they won't send one red cent 
to Atlantic City. I'd rather that gaming, those jobs created, and that gaming in New Jersey. Okay. Ms. Guadagno. So very quickly, um, once Atlantic City is stabilized, yes, I believe we should put on the ballot the question of whether or not, and it has to be on the ballot, the question of whether or not gaming should be up north. And I agree that if somebody's going to get the jobs, we should get the jobs. And I think we are in the best possible position to get those jobs on one condition. And that is that we can afford to do business here in New Jersey. Phil Murphy would eliminate tax credits. Phil Murphy would eliminate um, business. He would raise taxes on businesses, and he would make New Jersey unaffordable for anybody and very business unfriendly. Jessica Dean has our next question. I want to talk about pensions. Mr. Murphy, I'll start with you. You advocate fully funding the public employee pension system, which is currently severely underfunded. And obviously, we're obligated to pay what has already been committed. But going forward, would you consider the state switching new employees to a 401k type program like a lot of private businesses have done? I chaired the original commission on this 12 years ago. And if we had taken the steps that we had outlined, we wouldn't be in the position we're in today. But we are. Uh, the pension plans have been underfunded in the Christie Guadano years by $23 billion. That's not the only reason, but it's a principal reason why we've been downgraded 11 straight times. The state must own up to its obligations. It must get as fast as possible to fully funding its pension obligations. We're a state for many reasons, but this is one of the biggest ones that folks no longer trust. And trust is something at all costs we can't lose and we've lost it. So the answer is we've got to get back to fully funding the pension plan. Only then can you start talking about what else you're going to do. If you've been left at the altar 20 years in a row and most notably in the past eight years and the only answer is, hey, if you concede a little bit more, we might find a way to find more money. That's unacceptable. Uh, the state must meet its obligations. And for all those people at home who are owed that money, what is your specific plan? What the do you say to them? What are the specifics of that. Okay, here we go. Again, you've got an administration over here with Governor Christie that's taken care of hedge funds, big companies, and the wealthiest among us. They've had historically significant tax breaks. We want to unwind those tax breaks and fund getting back to funding the middle class in this in this state. Those are three big items. Public education, fully meeting our pension obligations and build the infrastructure that this administration has kicked down the road. All right. And Ms. Guadano, I'd like to know your specific plan. So uh, very simply, uh, it's going to cost $5 billion in pension payments. It's going to cost another $10 billion in health care uh, payments in order to fully fund the pension as suggested by my opponent. Um, I want everybody in this room to close their eyes and tell me what you see. <laughs> And you see nothing because we have no plan whatsoever. Phil has no plan whatsoever to fully fund that pension. What I would do is really simple. I would take the law enforcement pensions and spin them off because they're almost fully funded as it is. If they want to manage their pensions, they should manage their pension and they should do it in a way that does not impact or put taxpayers at risk. Then we have to sit down and admit what we cannot deny, and that is that the pensions for the teachers and other public sector unions is broke. What we're doing right now in New Jersey is hiring 21-year-old teachers and telling them that they will have a pension in 25 or 30 years. I would sit down, look at the Tom Byrne Healy uh, pension commission report and start negotiating there fairly, respectfully, and openly. Alfred Shouldn't there be a basic members. line here of telling the truth in these discussions? Absolutely. Oh, I mean, that's for our audience that you're making up. Please. Come on. Please. You're just making stuff uh, please. up. If you're going to start to interrupt these, these me, if you're going to start okay, to interrupt to again, both candidates, I will interrupt to both all candidates, so we really do need to, to keep on time. Argument. So we'll show all of us respect and just keep to the subject that matter. Diaflo Jalvin has the next question. Well, I'm going to try to literally get us back on the right track. Sure. So this is a transit question uh, to Ms. Budano. You have said that you, you will advocate for New Jersey Transit, that you have been a New Jersey Transit user, you've been a commuter. But under the Christie administration, we've seen dedicated funding has been cut, fares have gone up, service quality has gone down. We had a mass transit Super Bowl where tens of thousands of people waited hours to leave the stadium. We saw a large portion of the New Jersey Transit fleet left in the rain during Superstorm Sandy. So if you're the advocate, you've been there, where were you? 
Good question. Um, I know that the following. In the next four years, the very first thing I'm going to do is go back and audit everything that's going on at the Department of Transportation. I'm going to ask every single person we're allowed to ask by law to resign and reapply for their job. I'm going to make those people hand out their cell phone numbers like I do when I rehire them. I'm going to make those people sit down and actually take the train every day. I know what it's like to have to be to court on time and take a train out a little silver to get there. I know what it's like to have to be home on time in order to meet a babysitter so that um, she doesn't walk away from me. It is very important that we get this right. In fact, I would say that second to property taxes, it is the number one problem that will be facing the governor going forward. Well, you said that as, a, as the lieutenant governor, it's not your function to necessarily criticize the governor, but during all these changes not for the better with New Jersey Transit, you've been silent. Have you taken a New Jersey Transit train in the last five or six years? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the only way to get back and forth to New York. And I've also taken an Amtrak train. That's the only way to get back and forth. Unlike my opponent, who's a Goldman Sachs billionaire, I'm a working mom who has double W-2 income and my husband is retired. I have to take public transportation in order to get back and forth, Just not just now, but for the last 25 years. But to answer your question... Well, okay. I'm, I'm going to have to, to move on okay. to... to to Mr. Murphy. I want to take a slightly different tact here on transit. All right? Okay. We have something called positive train control. Yep. It's a signal system, slows down the train, the accident that happened in Hoboken where there's a fatality yep. that would stop it. Um, it has to be done by the end of 2018. That's the federal mandate. Yet a very small portion of the NJ transit system is operating underneath right. this system. How would you ensure, if you are elected, that NJ Transit can meet this deadline? First of all, I take NJ Transit and my family who's here take it all the time, number one. Number two, uh, again, where have you been? I mean, some of these ideas, I actually want to make sure that people know we agree on some things, but you've been there for almost eight years. Um, thirdly, you're dealt a hand if you're a state. Our hand is dealt fourth smallest state geographically in the country, densest state in the nation. We sit beside the largest market in the world in New York and one of the largest markets in the country in Philadelphia. You'd think if you got one thing right, it would be commuter rail. Instead, NJ Transit's been gutted by the state support. Fares are up 36%. I'd ask folks, is your experience commuting up 36%? And capital budget has been sucked into the operating side. People are in there who don't know what they're talking about in terms of leadership. Positive train control is one of the victims, is one of the consequences. Uh, we, we have to fund it. This is a mandate. It's a federal mandate. We have no choice. We have to get back to doing what we used to do really well in the state, prioritizing the economies that drove us. Infrastructure is one of them. But you didn't answer the question about positive train control. To fund it. It has to be done. There's no choice. Well, where would the funding come from? Would it come from more... Uh, well, the state there. has cut, the state has, first of all, we have to grow the economy again. That's something that we're not, we haven't talked about yet. We've left tens of billions of dollars on the table of economic growth in this administration. That's two or three billion dollars at least annually of state revenue, and that would be well enough to, to deal with positive train control. But you have to prioritize. Infrastructure has to be prioritized, and it has not been. I'd like to um, pose a con uh, question regarding congestion pricing, <laughs> two words that a lot of people in New Jersey do not want to hear. Congestion pricing to enter Manhattan really is looking more and more likely. It looks like it's going to become a reality. And New Jerseyans could actually be paying double now, once to cross the river and then again to move below 60th Street. Would you support a state tax rebate to offset the extra burden levied on commuters? Ms. Guadano, I'll let you answer first. The short answer to your question is absolutely. I think we need to use our tax credits wisely. I think over the last eight years, the way we used our tax credits was to encourage companies to stay here and grow here and expand here. I think the numbers show that they work. We've cut unemployment 50 percent. We have more people working today than ever in the history of the state. And just a report came out this week that we have 4 percent more in our back pocket than we had before. But the problem is, as you know, it is hard to get back and forth into uh, 
uh, New York, and most of our people, a lot of our people up north do work in the city. So I would advocate for a transportation credit. I would advocate for a review of all of our credits to make sure that the middle class and the working people of New Jersey have uh, more money in their pocket. That's what this, camp this campaign is Which completely about, whether or not New Jersey is affordable. One of the ways we can make New Jersey affordable is by a tax credit. The problem I have with my opponent is, quite frankly, he's going to increase taxes on just about everyone to do all of the things we've already outlined. So with that tax credit, how then do we pay for it? Well, the tax credit, it, what do you mean? It, uh, that's what I said. Well, we, we'll go back and re-examine. Uh, look, we've cut unemployment 50 percent, and we've done it by, by aggressively pursuing what is uh, the only tool we have in New Jersey to create jobs and keep jobs here and attract jobs here, like Subaru or Panasonic or LG Electronics or um, any of the companies down in Camden. You know, Camden was a mud flat a year ago or five years ago. Today, it's going to be the shining city on the hill because of tax credits. Without those credits, Camden would not be surviving. Right, I just have to interrupt you right there because we do, do need to get to Mr. Murphy on this question. Would you support a state yeah, tax yeah, rebate? Yeah, you have to. I think the first line of the defense, though, is to try to convince New York to, to not do it. Um, and how would you do that? We, it has well, the support of Governor we, we influence, It's been influenced before in the past when this has come up, and I think we need leadership that pushes back. We've had a real breakdown in terms of our ability to punch at our weight in the relationship between New Jersey and New York, whether it's in Port Authority projects, whether it's canceling the ARC tunnel, uh, whether it's a, a discussion like this. We don't punch at our weight. We don't have the leadership at the table, eye to eye, uh, defending the interests of all of us, but certainly our, our commuters. Um, I would just say, by the way, the tax credits to get jobs in New Jersey, we send them out at the rate of $162,000 dollars per job right now. Massachusetts, right now we have some friends, $22,000 a job. There's a reason for that. They've made the investments that we've ignored. And secently, the labor market is at a 10-year low in terms of participation. But the answer is you've got to hopefully convince them not to do it. Otherwise, you've got to find the money. All right. Levon Putney has our next question. Levon? Yes, and to start with Mr. Murphy. At the last debate, you said that legalizing marijuana for you was primarily a social justice issue? Yes. Well. You've also said, though, that to fund many of your proposed programs, the state needs to increase taxes on its wealthiest, uh, close loopholes, and legalize marijuana. Yep. So is legalizing it all about justice or really about tax revenue? Levon, if it doesn't pass the social justice test, uh, you can't talk about the, the revenue implications. And the fact of the matter is we have the widest white, non-white gap of persons incarcerated in America, in New Jersey. It's not the only reason, but the biggest contributing factor is our low-end drug crimes. I'm, I'm saying this as much as a former national board member of the NAACP as I am as a candidate. So it's got to pass the social justice uh, test. My opponent last week, and I'm glad you brought it up because we had another incomplete discussion, talked about decriminalizing it. The problem I have with that is the industry, the drug industry, stays underground run by the same people and it's unregulated. So therefore, minors in particular are exposed to that. Put aside the fact you don't earn the, the tax revenue, which is also a real, reality, the fact is it remains the Wild West. So I want to legalize it, regulate it. I'm glad we're not the first state because a lot of other states have done it and made mistakes. Uh, and at the end of the day, will we earn some revenues from it? Yes, but it's got to be social justice first. No, go down up, Ms. Guadana. So I want to pick up, pick up quickly on, on what he originally said in the primary. What Phil Murphy said in the primary was he was going to increase taxes by a billion dollars. Three hundred million of that money was coming from legalizing marijuana. He has since changed his story to add the social justice aspect of it, That's which right. decriminalizing f fixes. But it falls under Murphy's law. Any, any tax that can be raised will be raised. And that's what the people of New Jersey need to know, that with all of these promises, all of these fantasies, all of these entitlements, it's going to come from your pocket. There are not enough millionaires in New Jersey to pay for the type of increases that Phil Murphy is promising you. It is like promising a, uh, a chicken in every pot. It's not going to happen. It's a fantasy, and people in New Jersey know it. Ms. Cardano, uh, just as a follow-up, uh, you're talking about bringing in revenue, but at the same time, why are you not willing to fully legalize recreational marijuana if it would? Well, very simple, because I just read a report from Denver, Colorado, or from Colorado that shows that there's been a 48% increase in the number of traffic deaths 
which they attribute to marijuana use in Colorado. I don't want our children, I don't want our people to walk down the street and buy a pack of cigarettes and be drug dealers. I think it's a problem for the state of New Jersey. I think it sends a very large message for a state that's fighting the opioid problem. And I think that if we're going to, Phil Murphy should just call it what it is, which is just another one of his tax raising policies. But, moving on to a, that? That? Moving, we got to really move on to another okay. topic. With all due respect, Mr. Murphy, Jessica's got this question. This next question comes from our debate participant, Positive Community Magazine. Development of New Jersey's two largest cities, Newark and Jersey City, has grown tax bases and the number of businesses. But residential rental prices are now trending upward. They're displacing low-income residents. So what policies do you envision to prevent long-standing residents from being displaced by gentrification. Ms. Guadano, we'll start with you. Well, I think it is a, a problem that we have to be alert to. One of the programs that um, the the tax credits are supposed to pay attention to is making sure that they hire people in the community that they get, get that get the tax credits. For example, in Jersey City, they got billions of dollars worth of tax credits. Um, they're supposed to be hiring people. In Camden, they are. There's a company called Holtec that got $200 million worth of tax credits, and they are actually hiring Camden citizens and training them in Ohio and bringing them back. Those are the kinds of things we have to monitor, make sure happen, and are in fact are happening in places in New Jersey. It's a condition of the credit itself. Um, and the other thing we have to do is fix the Affordable, Care, Affordable um, Housing Act. What we have to do, in my opinion, is come up with a state plan to put jobs where there is transportation, or put affordable housing where the jobs are and where transportation are. We can do that by simply having a, a state plan. Mr. Murphy? I can't help but go back at the beginning to the last conversation about uh, legalization. Number one, Colorado has had a meaningful reduction in opioid deaths and it's directly correlated to legalization of marijuana. And number two, number two, number two, social justice is not an entitlement. Um, so the, the, big, the big crux of your, your question mm -hmm. is affordable housing. And this administration has done everything they can to kick the can down the road through That's the courts. That's not true. Uh, they have uh, taken money out of dedicated funds. That's not true. They have not done, well, I apologize, you'll have your, your shot. Um, they've also not done what other states have done, which is to buy up empty foreclosed homes and convert them into affordable is housing. That in, would that be something you would uh, want to do? One hundred percent. And the concern I have with a Jersey City or a Newark, and I say this all the time, is I want to I wanna help for the folks who fought and stayed, not just for the folks who come there because the cities and those communities have momentum, and, but they sure do, by the way. It's got to work for the people who fought and stayed, and it's affordable housing. Since we are at William Patterson University, we thought it was a good idea to have students come involved, Absolutely. be involved in this democratic process. So we'd like to welcome a student here from William Patterson. His name is Kazir Siddiqui, and he has a question for both of you candidates. Kazir. Hi, uh, my question is, the student debt is above $1 trillion in America. Some people aren't even able to pursue higher education due to the huge debt. New York has recently started offering, uh, they started offering free tuition programs to students. Would you support free college programs for bachelor degrees in New Jersey? And if you do, how would you pay for it? Mr. Murphy, we'll let you answer that first. Great question, by the way. This is one that comes up all the time. Higher education has become out of the reach of too many uh, young people and their families. It's maddening. You probably have seen this. The University of Maine advertises in a billboard uh, above the turnpike, come on up and check us out. Our out-of-state tuition is lower than your in-state tuition. Um, we've defunded, we've ravaged higher education in the state. So a couple of things. There's no one magic bullet that gets you solved here, Kazir. Number one, we stand for free community college. At most, it's a $200 million a ticket on a $35 billion budget. There's a study that came out this summer that makes the compelling point uh, that that's the middle skill job that we're going to be, be the least, um, we're going to have the least numbers of folks who are trained in. Secondly, we love the idea of a public bank that we all as citizens own, and one of the lines of business is reasonable student loans. And thirdly, how about something like stay in New Jersey for college, stay here five years after to work, and then we'll forgive years six, seven, eight, nine, ten, X thousands of dollars off your outstanding loans. Those are some of the things we talked about. Ms. Guadano. So 
first, I think I, I, I have to comment on the public bank. The public bank of New Jersey is what I call the wacky bank of New Jersey. I can't imagine a worse idea than giving all of the receipts it to, the, to some bureaucrat in Trenton to hand out to other people. So uh, the idea of a bank handing out loans to students um, is just, just uh, beyond words fantasy land. That's the first. Second, free college education falls in the category of who's going to pay for it. I would love to provide you with a free college education. And if you have the means to pay for it, do I still want to provide you with a free college education? Because that's what my opponent is saying. My opponent says that whether you can afford it or not, you get a free college education. And you know what? who's gonna pay for it? Look around this room, look into the camera, and you will know who's going to pay for it. Everyone in New Jersey is going to pay for it. Phil Murphy is going to raise your taxes, and I won't. Alfred Doblin has our next question. Uh, this is going to start with, with you, Ms. Guidano. Uh, just this Monday, Republican and Democratic state leaders agreed that Newark is going to be the state's official <laughs> bid city for Amazon's new headquarters. If New Jersey gets it, it'd be 50,000 jobs. How far would you go, how far would your administration go with incentives, tax breaks, subsidies, land, to get Amazon to come to New Jersey. So my understanding of the deal is quite simply that that there will be tax credits afforded to um, Amazon as part of the deal, as part of the package that the uh, <clears throat> Partnership for Action will be presenting, and that the benefit to the taxpayers of New Jersey, that means the net benefit <clears throat> to the taxpayers of New Jersey, would be $9 billion over time. I have signed a letter that said I would agree to that. My concern is that we don't have enough people playing there. I, I love Newark. We've worked very hard to rebuild Newark. Work, but the problem is that we need a bigger menu. We need to put North Brunswick, we need to put Camden, we need to put Atlantic City as, as also competitors. I don't think we could and should reject any of those. Well, 50,000 jobs is a lot of jobs um, that we need. And the problem is if my opponent actually becomes the governor of the state of New Jersey, he will not use any of those well, tax credits. To go back credits. to the point of, of the question, whether, we, whether it's Newark, whether right. it was New Brunswick, um, is there a point of too much that we give back well, the to only, get those jobs. I understand, Alfred. So the, the only way these credits work is if the net benefit the, to the taxpayers over time is exceeds the value of the credits. That's the way it's always been. You have to make more money for the taxpayers than you give out. And in this case, my understanding from the letter that was written to us from the government, that it would be $9 billion for the benefits. And quite frankly, I don't think you can put a value on bringing 50,000 jobs to New Jersey. However, if my opponent becomes the governor of the state of New Jersey, we don't have a shot because we're not going to have tax credits. We're going to raise um, business taxes. We're going to raise taxes on people who live here, and Amazon will not find New Jersey a business-friendly place anymore. Well, Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy. May I? Um, I, first of all, I hope Amazon comes to New Jersey. That would be a game changer. But this, they've got to come on terms that not just work for them, but they've got to work for us. I, I looked at what they're looking at. Um, we line up awfully well. It reminds me of what General Electric said they were looking for before they moved to Boston. By the way, we didn't get an at-bat in the competition for General Electric, because all we do is we throw out tax credits under this administration to the tune of $162,000. I'd like to go to Amazon with a competitive tax deal, because it's going to take that, but also say, listen, we're going to put $5 billion into Newark Liberty. We're going to build out Hudson Bergen Light Rail. We're going to actually build the Gateway Tunnel under the Hudson. We're going to fully fund public education. We're going to put money back into higher education. All of those things will be good for Amazon and their employees, but the, the more important news is, they'll be good for all of us. So I hope we get Amazon, but I want to get them on the right terms. I also would love to have gotten Amazon when it started. We have 15 technology incubators in the state of New Jersey. New York has 179. That doesn't happen by accident. That's ignoring it on this side of the Hudson and embracing it on that side. I don't think the state of Washington had to put one dollar to work to get Amazon started. It's public policy that we need to get behind that reignites that entrepreneurial innovation economy. Levon, please take the next question. Yes. You mentioned earlier that New Jersey is the fourth smallest state, but somehow we've managed to fit 565 municipalities in the Garden State. Uh, but even then, 
<laughs> Given that state tax dollars go to these towns for police and other services, uh, what specifically can you do to convince more communities to merge or share? We'll start with Mr. Murphy. Yeah, listen, the good, uh, someone once said, don't let a good crisis go to waste. And the crisis, <clears throat> the property tax crisis, uh, during the Christie Guadana years has forced a lot of people to really think about sharing services that may, may not have thought about it before. So there's a lot of appetite out there, but you need leadership. Uh, and you've got some counties that have it in extreme. Bergen County has 70 communities. We live in Monmouth County, 53 communities. Now the thing that I, I, I believe with all my heart is you can't beat people over the head. There are different levels of government and representation. This is democracy. But you can provide leadership and incentives. And we've said, listen, if you two mayors and councils want to explore a, uh, a possible sharing of services, we'll help fund that. And if you go ahead and each of you independently say, you know what, we want to actually go ahead and do this, we'll help fund that as well. We, we think we need to offer incentives to communities uh, and leadership to get that done. So we'll appoint a, a shared services czar, we'll put real resources behind it, and we'll be aggressive. Well, of course, we have to do more shared services. The problem is if we don't have an arbitration cap and a 2% cap, an answer which my opponent has yet to provide to any of us, then there won't be any incentive for these merging of, of any of the 560-some-odd um, municipalities or the 612 schools. What we do need to do is incentivize that, and the way to do that is to put pressure on the property taxes, keep property taxes low. My plan would keep property taxes even lower than the 2% cap. Phil Murphy, on the other hand, because he is in the pocket of the special interest, because he has promised the labor unions that he won't sign the arbitration cap or the 2% cap, is never going to see those kinds of savings that we could otherwise realize. Jessica Dean. So you guys have a lot to say about one another and each other's policies. It's nice to have each other ask one another a question. So Ms. Guadano, I'll let you do that first. What is your question to Mr. Murphy? Well, the question is really very simple. How do you plan to pay for free pre-K, fully funding the K through 12, free college education, um, universal health care, uh, just to name a few? I think they add up to be anywhere from 50 to 65 billion dollars without raising taxes on the middle class and the working class because your plan right now provides only a billion dollars, and I say only a billion dollars. Anybody who runs a campaign that says they're going to raise taxes in New Jersey is simply out of touch with New Jerseyans. But how do you plan on paying for all of the promises that you made during the primary? That's quite a question. Um, you know those numbers aren't true, and you're saying them, and you're making them up, and you're talking about me and the turnpike and fares and running for president. We got to get back and base this discussion on the truth, because that's what people showed up for to hear tonight. Um, you've, you've, you've got. Um, uh, sorry, I couldn't hear you there. Sorry. Uh, you've, you've had the backs Answers of hedge the funds. Question was you've had the. the shout. You've had Excuse me, we would like to keep a certain decorum yeah. and professionalism in this room. I, I, I apologize you, for the interruption. He I, is answering I the hope, question. I and again, were, once again, if we hear any more interruptions, you will be asked to leave the auditorium. Thank you. I, I Mr. hope Mr. you Murphy, were as aggressive go. this with uh, Governor Christie all these years in debating policy. Um, you've taken care of hedge funds, big corporations, and the wealthiest among us that have had the sweetest ride of their lives, and that's going to come to an end. It's going to be tax fairness and the big beneficiary is the middle class and we have a very cogent plan where the, the, the schools will be funded, the pensions will be finally fully obligated and we will grow the economy. This is an economy, folks, we got to remember we're one of the weakest economies in the country. Household income is down 5% during your years with Governor Christie and property taxes are up 17, NJ transit fares are up 36, uh, cost of sending your kid to college is up 20. The middle class has been squeezed and left behind. So I would just say to the middle class, help is on the way. Mr. Murphy, what is your question to Ms. Guadagna? I would ask, listen, I said this earlier and I meant it. There are some things we agree on, things like audits, uh, things like uh, some other smart government. Where have you been? Could you describe more uh, uh, explicitly for us? You've been at Chris Christie's side for 2,829 days. 
And this is the state that we have as a result of that. You've made choices. You've chosen to, t to take care of hedge funds and the very wealthiest among us at the, at the expense of the middle class. I'd like to know where have you been? Well, I think, first of all, what you have to understand is I went back when he said 12... 2,821 days, and I figure that's about the amount of money you made per hour while you were in Goldman Sachs as one of those hedge funds. That's got a lot to do with your answer, right? <laughs> The second thing I think you have to understand, and I've said it before, is that the governor makes the ultimate decision, like the president makes the ultimate decision. If I had a battle with the governor, and I did have a number of battles with the governor, I made those in private, and I believe that's the way the system works the best. I only started the battle with the governor publicly when he started to hurt the middle class with a 23 cent gas tax increase, something, by the way, that Phil Murphy completely endorsed, and that, to me, is not helping the middle class. That is not building up the middle class. That is hurting the very people who need the gas tax relief the most. May I just say, this is after you and Governor Christie bankrupted the Transportation Trust Fund, and I'm looking at Sheila Oliver. She's going to be my partner 50-50 every step of well, the I'm way. I'm glad you talked about Sheila Oliver. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned Sheila Oliver because never forget that Sheila Oliver was the speaker of the assembly for every single one of the governor's budgets. And had this budget not been presented and voted on in favor of it unanimously by Sheila Oliver and her Democrat colleagues, it never would have gotten to the governor's desk. So the transportation trust fund for one example, the tax credits for another example, all lay at the feet of your hand-picked lieutenant governor. I'm so honored to be on the ballot with Sheila. All right. I would like to go to our flash round where we ask for some brief answers, our flash round. Okay. It's always a little fun. I think we're, we were, we're due for, to have some fun Mix right now. Mix it up a little bit. Okay, yep. absolutely. I thought we were mixing it up. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to move on to our flash round, and we'd like yes. to just give some brief answers. That's the term flash round. My flash first question goes to you, Mr. Murphy. If Senator Menendez is, conviction, is convicted of corruption, should he resign? Listen, I think any speculation on someone who's in the middle of a trial is a complete waste of time. So the answer is he's innocent until proven guilty, uh, and let's see how this turns out. But if period. he is proven guilty I'm not gonna speculate. and convicted, I'm not gonna speculate. will you ask him to resign? I'm not going to speculate. You're going on the record that you will, I will not wait to see how tonight. this turns out, and that's what we all should do. Okay. The lieutenant Ms. governor is a Ms. lawyer, and Ms. she would also know that persons are allowed their, their full extent of the law. Ms. Guadano, should Senator Menendez be convicted of corruption, should he resign? Absolutely. It is an embarrassment. That, that Phil Murphy has stood silently by the side of Senator Menendez for two years while he's been under indictment, it will be even a greater embarrassment if we have a United States Senator representing the state of New Jersey in the Senate in Washington, D.C. Are we still so in America? To follow, up, to follow excuse me, just to follow up on my question to you, Ms. Guadano, hypothetically, if Senator Menendez is convicted and you ask him to resign, will you then obviously get to pick the uh, replacement? Would you consider Chris Christie? No. You will... <laughs> Record saying you will not consider Chris Christie. Very much on the record that I will not consider Chris Christie. All right. This this next question, you know, we, we held a, a series of town virtual town meetings with our viewers, and they turned out very successful, and many of them had some very great questions. But this one stood out to us the most. New Jersey is the Garden State, and as such, what is your favorite fruit? and vegetable and why mr murphy for me yeah oh grapefruit what are you looking at me for grapefruit okay <laughs> and broccoli okay. now listen and i know why? that makes me weird but i'm a in huge jersey. broccoli fan oh i, I in love new jersey it has quickly to be. quickly why I don't, I tell you, I love, I've loved broccoli since I was a kid. I wish my late mom and dad were here. They would be able to give you a better answer than right. I can. Ms. Guadano, what Jersey was tomatoes and cranberries. <laughs> Hamilton, 
I mean, all right, we do it's, have it's, to. It's, that was fun, right? That was fun. That was fun. That was fun. Now it's the time now to hear from the candidates for your closing statements. A coin toss earlier determined who will go first. You will each have 90 seconds, Mr. Murphy. I'd say, first of all, thank you. Only in America can a guy who grew up as I did, working poor, to a mom who got out of high school and a dad who didn't find himself on a stage like this tonight. So I'm incredibly honored and humbled. We heard two very clear ver visions for our state tonight. One is more of the same. In, in, in essence, another Chris Christie term, where the middle class is hollowed out, the truth is left behind. Uh, public education doesn't get funded, infrastructure is ignored, we become more unfair by the day, and it's constant us against them. Or we could turn the page and embrace change and new leadership and new priorities, priorities where we respect our seniors, we celebrate and invest in our middle class and in the dreams of those who aspire to get into the middle class. We fund public education and infrastructure. We become fair and inclusive for all again. We fund Planned Parenthood. We sign sensible gun safety laws. We do something about climate change and we reject gimmicks and we deliver real tax relief to the middle class. On the one hand, you've got folks who want to scare you to follow them and vote for them. That's not where I come from. I come from being grown up, being inspired by people like John Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King and Cesar Chavez and Barack Obama. And if that's your vision, I need you. I need your vote on November 7. Thank you. seconds starting now 90 right. seconds so thank you I want to speak to the people at home I want to talk to those people that are saying to themselves why should I go to the ballot on November 7th and how do I decide I think the answer is very very clear Phil Murphy will raise your taxes I will lower them and that's why you should go to the ballot box on November 2nd we need your vote you know I grew up moving all around the country my dad lost his job I moved 12 times before I went to college. I know what it means when a family has to leave a state and a town that they grew to love. I don't want to see New Jerseyans do the same thing. I put myself through college, I put myself through law school, and I was lucky enough to marry a guy from Jersey where I knew I wanted to raise my family. My family has been raised in New Jersey, and I think the reason why I'm running for governor, in fact, I know the reason why I'm running for governor, is because I don't want other families in New Jersey to lead the life that I led. I don't want my chil their children to be raised the way I had to be raised. If Phil Murphy becomes the governor of the state of New Jersey, the only person who will be able to afford to stay in New Jersey will be Phil Murphy. He has promised to raise taxes on just about everybody, and it proved it tonight. Vote for lower taxes, vote for a safer New Jersey, and please, right, on and November 7th, does vote for your me. 90 seconds. Thank you both for a very spirited debate. I would like to thank my fellow panelists for being here today. I would also like to thank William Patterson University tonight for hosting this. Election day is November 7th. Please be sure to go out and vote. I'm Christine Johnson. I'll be back at 11 o'clock on CBS 2 News at 11. Thanks for joining us.